Hi, everyone. Um, in some ways, I think that when I started to write about New York, I was writing myself into New York. And I'm being, let me be more clear. Tony Morrison says, you write the books you need to read. Right. And very realistically, through no fault of my own, I lived in a very, very sort of rarefied environment. I grew up in Adam Clayton Powell's house. I was, uh, you know, in many ways, my family, through no fault of our own, were what I'm going to call, for want of a better term, Hertz Renoblacks. We were the first here and the first there, okay? There's a terrible price one pays for that. And again, I'm very happy that things happened the way they did. But very realistically, for example, I was the first Afro-American to go to the collegiate school. And I went there in uh, 1957. That was wonderful on some levels. It was also horrible. I realized very quickly that I was going from one ghetto to another, and to know that at age one, <laughs> right? To understand, right? And again, I'm saying this realistically. What we're talking about is power, right? That we go from one power base to another. And I think in some sense, I published a, a fair number of books not trying to be autobiographical, understandable, right? That's my sense being, in some ways, well, I'll put that off, I'll get to it some other point, and that seems to me easy. But then I suddenly realized that, you know, if I didn't talk about some of the things I saw, and if I didn't do it with a great deal of both fidelity, honesty, clarity, and in some sense also, and this is the most difficult thing, being very, very tough on myself and others, then it seemed to me, to a large degree, I did not exist. Right? And it was a very odd situation. I mean, it was very strange for me to be, to know, for example, Dr. Martin Luther King, to know Duke Bellington, but to know what as a kid does. Right? I mean, when you're a kid, what you remember about someone who's, quote, famous is whether he or she was nice to you. <laughs> right? Duke Ellington was a nice man. He used to like to play with me. <laughs> There were some other people I won't mention who were not so nice. <laughs> well, they were nice, but they were otherwise occupied, and I was a kid. Right. So I think, I think that my sense of New York, interestingly enough, was that New York was a wonderful place, but it was largely, at least for me, a problem. Right. It was a wonderfully rich, multifaceted. I, I lived, actually, interestingly enough, seven blocks from, from Ralph Ellison. And he and I would work on the library commission. And I, when I was a, a kid, right? And the thing that was great about Ellison was that Ellison spoke in publishing the prose. It was really quite amazing. <laughs> but, but what that did for me, right, as a person, is made me realize, one, that you had a real, you needed to have a real sort of commitment to many diverse populations. And I don't want to go on and on, but I want to just say this, that, and I had to say this at the beginning. When I, when I sent my first, I wrote an essay, and I had horrible, quite horrible things happened to me, and I'm not going to go into all that stuff, right? Lots of terrible things happened to my family, and yet everyone in my family loved one another. And that is, in some sense, the essential corroboration. right? And all the other stuff didn't matter. I knew that. I, the, I, I remember writing this essay, and I sent it to Bob Fogarty, and he called me in, I don't know, two or three days. right? And I think there are a million writers, not millions, but there are numerous writers who have found that level of corroboration, and it is lifeblood itself. I hope that the Antioch Review uh, lives for a million years. I hope that Antioch College lives for a million years. <laughs> we need you all. Henry Van Dyke. Can you hear me now?
down. And you know what I'm saying? No problem. Okay. My beginning the beginning to write stemmed from a very perverse and bizarre fashion at 11 and 12 years old. I have to prelude this with uh, the fact that my parents, my parents moved from Michigan, they were northerners, and moved south to Alabama State, Alabama Texas College it's called, Montgomery, Alabama, where later they did know Martin Luther King and so forth. My father was a professor of science and in chemistry, the mother's English professor. My father thought that I needed some very strong education. You know, I had lived amongst the tiny little village in Michigan with mostly white people. Some of whom were my relatives, white relatives I didn't quite know. My father was anxious about my perception of the South. At 12, 11 and 12, he took me out of the countryside, very near Alabama State College, to a place just offset by Cloverdale, a very ritzy white area that was then, to see men hanging on trees, black men, their genitals rotten, their eyes bulging, being eaten by bugs. Why are you showing this day? You forced me to look. You want to make sure that I know that I knew what could happen to me when I messed around with white women. Well, the problem was I was already at the teeter edge of trying to convince myself that I was straight. Pretty well knew that I wasn't, but I was afraid. And suddenly I was he tipped the vessel. <laughs> I knew then, I didn't care about all that, I didn't think. Nevertheless, curiosity grows. Who are these, who is this thing called woman that, that men would sacrifice their lives for, be willing to get hung for, accused for, maybe sometimes they're wrong with us, and sometimes they did for the reason I mean, I suppose they get caught. I was horrified, of course, and the images of these men of uh, rotting on trees uh, in a way that I think a Sudan called Strange Fruit, singer, the Hollywood. When I went north back, back to high school and college in Ann Arbor, I uh, continued this curiosity about women. I soon, I wasn't really quite sure I was going to be a writer, but I didn't know that. People would always say, write about what you know, write about what you know. Well, no, 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 no. You write about what you want to know, I have decided. What I want to know. So my quest was women, in a sense. But I, thought I wasn't really that strong in writing then. When I came to New York, I decided that I would be writing stories, the novel. I dealt with, uh, the first novel was Ladies of the Rock Mud and All Eyes, which took place in Michigan. Old Jewish lady and her companion, black companion servant, who hated and loved each other. And they were very the games. Later on, without really thinking about it too much, I translated this into uh, two other ladies who were called Beatrice Blitz and May Barnes. And they were they were same characters, a younger, 50-ish, very sophisticated, <coughs> went to the opera, lived together at Gramsci Park, very uh, upscale. And I didn't really know them particularly, but I tried my best to 
learn as much as I could. So then began my quest of finding out as much as I could about a certain movement. In the course of time, I wrote a series of stories called 34 Gravity Park. All 12 concerned with women of various sorts. The most famous, I think, won a prize in uh, the Antioch Review, the Summer Masquerade, it was called, in which I wrote a raving lesbian who was almost seven feet tall. She came about through serious requests. I see a picture of Peter Sacco West in magazines and newspapers. I'd seen a woman in Connecticut, a real live version of it. It's a tall woman with a straw hat. Overalls. I got to know her a tiny bit. I tried to know her better, but she was not interested. Then, I was in London, a little bit outside of London, in Bewley, a place called Bewley. My friends, Lord Edward Montague and his wife had invited me down to the castle. And sure enough, out there in the garden was the same woman, and just slightly different. So I began to mold the shape and find out, ask questions, and began to mold the character, which stimulated me to write in this person I called Fedora, which, thank goodness, uh, Bob and his editor's night in magazine, which is published in the first of several issues ago. But I go through the, the 12 stories and see most of them all about women, stemming from this desire to know about them, quest to know about them. Some, I think, are more successful than others, but nevertheless, I do know that's where it all started. Even the novel, about Virgil Thompson and Carl Van Deschen, which is kind of spoof on them. Really, had, they had wives. One had like Ellen had a courtesan. And even they were controlled by these women. And when the subject came up for this panel, I thought, my God, what am I doing? I'm not women. It's women. It's women. But I think it stems back from that. that, that that knowledge, that lack of knowledge, that fright that I had back when I was 11, 12. And I say that I'm more interested in that, that source and that idea than any other. And uh, I feel that uh, even my father in his own wisdom, He's a statistic to this, but in his own wisdom, maybe he uh, put beyond something that really was why. And the fact that I was living in New York, questioned these women for answers and so forth, is New York characters that I suppose had the lived in Chicago, St. Louis, Atlanta. I wonder whether or not I would have had, I would have the same spirit, but there's an attitude and a feeling about New York which is distinct and intangible. And I think it's one reason that I, I think many writers write about characters in New York who try to grasp this kind of New Yorkish intangible thing that I haven't seen displayed so beautifully in St. Louis, Chicago, and San Francisco. So there you are. Thank you.